I want to welcome everybody to the GLREA Solar Story um, presentation. We, we do this almost every Thursday night, along with renewable energy seminars. And we do this for purposes of discussing various issues or ray cases. So we're really honored to have all of you join us tonight. Tonight, we're having a special presentation because it's about the DTE ray case. And John Richter, who is a board member of GLREA, and he's also our senior policy analyst for GLREA. He's going to be talking about the um, update to the DTE Ray case. And just so you all know, you know, the, the Great Lakes Renewable Energy Association, we do basically two things. The first thing we do is educate people about the benefits of solar, and we encourage people to, to install a solar or geothermal system. The other thing we do is that we try and impact on regulatory and policy in general, because we're trying to establish a policy framework that supports the expansion of solar in Michigan. And we do this through the Michigan Public Service Commission, as well as the state legislature to a small degree. But tonight is all about regulatory policy. So I'm gonna turn it over right now to John Richter, who's gonna discuss the most recent updates regarding the DTE rate case. So thank you very much and John, take it away. Thank you, John. So Michigan's regulated utilities um, have to file rate cases in order to increase their rates. Uh, DTE Electric uh, is no exception. And so every 11 months or so, uh, each of the electric utilities files a rate case. Uh, we are interveners in uh, this case. I've filed testimony uh, in the case. Um, and uh, so I'm going to talk about its current status because it has a lot of impact on the economics of home solar. Uh, I'll talk about the status of the case, uh, DTE's uh, rate increase, right, that's going to increase electric rates for everyone, uh, their solar proposals, and then some other issues that have uh, come up in the case, uh, community solar, uh, the idea of a tariff for uh, after the cap on distributed generation is hit. Selling renewable energy certificates to DTE, which is a new idea, and uh, DTE's green power program. So they filed their case uh, in January. Um, it's a fairly typical filing. They've got uh, 1,600 pages of testimony and 2,700 pages of exhibits. Uh, so, you know, it, it takes a little while to read this. Um, staff and exhibitors have filed testimony, exhibits, rebuttal, briefs, and reply briefs. So there's a whole series of stages that each case goes through. And we're now at the point where the judge has issued her proposal for decision. That's called a PFD. It's one of the few acronyms I'm going to throw at you here, uh, covering all of the issues in the case. Now, the proposal for the decision document itself is 749 pages. Um, this is not the final step of the case, though. The MPSC order uh, that will end the case is expected in November, and that may differ from the PFD. The, the commissioners, uh, the MPSC commission is three commissioners who are appointed by the governor, and they are not bound by the PFD at all. They could throw it in the trash and do whatever they want, but historically, they usually do pretty much what the PFD says with maybe an exception here or there. So it's uh, an important milestone in the case, although it's not the end. So DTE had proposed to increase rates by a total of $388 million a year uh, with a 8.8% increase in residential rates. Uh, the PFD then goes through a long list, right? Now I'll just address those top line numbers. They go through a long list of expense items and say, yes, this, you know, we're approving. And this, no, this really should be rejected uh, and, and not included. And they they narrowed that down to uh, $146 million. Uh, so less than half of what was requested. That's not all that unusual. Uh, it, usually the request gets trimmed down quite a bit. The utilities have a habit of throwing in a lot of pork and fat and crazy things and things that barely defined and... Um, uh, the attorney general's office in particular goes through those and, and cites things that, that don't belong there and, and a lot of stuff gets taken out. So some of this is, is kind of a game of we're going to ask for more than we want, knowing that it's going to get trimmed some. So, uh, yeah, it got cut by more than half. That I, 
it's not necessarily an enormous victory like it sounds. DTE proposed two big changes uh, affecting solar customers. So um, solar customers can consume some of the energy that they generate themselves, and that's just reducing your bill, right? So you're, you're effectively getting the full uh, electric rate for the energy that you don't buy from the utility because you've generated some and used it uh, on site. But for the energy that you generate that's excess of your consumption at the moment that you then outflow, and that's the, the term, the regulatory term, you outflow to the grid, um, we currently get a credit from DTE and they're proposing to cut that from the current rate, which is around eight cents a kilowatt hour, down to the wholesale rate of electricity, the price that utilities pay each other when they buy and sell electricity, which is now between three and a half and four cents a kilowatt hour. <clears throat> it's a little higher than last year because uh, natural gas prices are up. And they would do this immediately to all solar customers. There's no grandfather clause, right? There's no, well, you get to keep the rate you have for the next five years or no, just as soon as it becomes effective, boom, it would affect everyone. The second thing they proposed <clears throat> is that all new solar residential customers would not be able to sign up for the, the standard tariffs, the standard electric rates that, that you and I are paying. <clears throat> they would be subject to a new tariff, which they call the stable bill tariff. And it's completely different uh, than any of the other residential tariffs. The majority of your cost under this is based not on how much electricity you consume during the month, but on the maximum amount you consumed in three hours across the last 12 months. So if there were three hours where your demand was particularly high, let's say you have a pottery kiln that you fired up, right? Uh, you're going to pay for that every month for, for the following year. Um, I see Mark Cleavey laughing, but that was actually an example somebody cited in, in testimony, and it's a great one. Um, on the uh, outflow credit, the GLRA and many other interveners uh, opposed the cut and argued for actually a higher credit, that the, the current rate is, is not, not just. Um, and the, the law requires that that outflow rate be set based on the cost of service, right? If we're outflowing power to the utility, how much does that really save them? And that's not the wholesale rate, which is what they were arguing, which was ridiculous. And the judge agreed, uh, recommending actually a slight in, uh, increase in the outflow rate. So it's currently set at the power supply minus the small portion of the power supply that's, that's transmission costs. That's about 0.2 cents a kilowatt hour, that transmission cost. They're now recommending that be included. So um, if this was, if the commission agrees with the PFD, that would increase our outflow rate uh, by a small 0.2 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, but it's uh, an important line in the sand for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that, hey, keep, keep asking to cut the rate and we'll keep increasing it, right? I, I kind of like that response. Um, but the other thing is that the utilities have argued there, there's a, a portion of the uh, statute that requires that the outflow credit must be either the wholesale rate or transmission minus uh, distribution or minus trans, power supply minus transmission. And the commission has said multiple times that that section of law does not apply to the way we're doing the DG program uh, with instantaneous netting. And the utilities keep saying, oh, yes, it does. Oh, yes, it does. So if the commission approves this, they're again refuting that and saying, no, that doesn't apply, which means there's other things we can ask for and will. <laughs> Regarding the stable bill tariff, um, right, the proposal was this would be voluntary for any customers, but it'd be mandatory for new solar customers and that uh, your bill would have these two new charges on it based on your highest three hours of consumption and your per kilowatt hour rate would be much lower. Um, well, that completely kills any incentive for energy efficiency, right? Uh, and you may as well consume more because you're really being charged based on those peak hours. Suddenly that's your attention now, right? Not how much energy you're consuming. It, it really didn't make sense. Uh, the PFD agreed. They said that the proposed rate was not cost-based. It does not send accurate or actionable price signals to participating customers. 
and customers would face significant price penalties for up to one year, uh, the, the whole thing should be rejected, um, which is, you know, exactly what we had proposed. So that's uh, good news. Uh, I would have been really stunned if they, they'd recommended accepting that because it was just so bizarre. Um, also in the case, uh, community solar came up. Um, so staff, Julie Baldwin, who's uh, kind of our hero uh, in on the commission staff there, recommended the creation of a community solar program uh, primarily, but not restricted to those who can't put solar on their house, right? If you're running an apartment, you're renting a house, you have a house that's shaded by trees. Um, you know, you, you can't feasibly put solar on your house and get the benefits. This would be a program that would provide similar benefits without having to own a house that that's suitable for solar. Um, so in, in Julie's recommendation, the, the solar project financing, the construction, the subscriptions would be arranged by a subscriber organization. And it doesn't really define who that is. It's somebody that's not the utility, right? It could be a nonprofit organization. It could be a corporation, uh, whatever. Uh, but the subscribers would then get a credit that would be similar to the DG program. Um, the judge agreed that that was a good idea, which is, is a big deal. Uh, but said, we can't really do it in this case. There's not time to work out all the details. Um, but said, as a first step, we should draft a tariff for the program, get it into the rate structure, even though no one's on it yet. And then a future program could then utilize that tariff. So they're kind of suggesting we take the first step in that direction and work out the details of the program later. Um, that's that's a positive development, right? It's certainly uh, better than than anything we've had uh, in the past. And then we have this other problem with the DG program, right? So the law limits the amount of customer solar that the utilities must support under the DG program. Uh, that limit was originally uh, put in the statute that created net metering. And then when they replace net metering with the distributed generation program, they didn't repeal the cap, which is what almost every, it's what every other state that's repealed net metering has done, right? But that didn't happen here in Michigan. We're unique. Um, DT is going to hit that cap for their residential DG program sometime next year. And they've offered to increase it if they got those two other programs, the drastic cut in outflow rate and their ridiculous uh, demand charge based stable bill program. And they said, if we don't get those, we're not going to raise the cap uh, too bad. Um, the GLRA and several other interveners argue that the commission should address that and set up some sort of tariff that would apply for DG outflow after the cap is reached. The company said, oh, no, that, that's not necessary. Um, you can use one of these two programs that exists. Uh, one of them is called Rider 5. That's used by PURPA um, companies. So that's a corporation that sets up a large solar farm and sells the all the electricity to DTE. Uh, there's a whole set of regulations and law and everything about that, but it requires signing a contract that has all kinds of onerous corporate law rules that a homeowner could never do, right? It, I mean, it, it, it's not even remotely feasible. Um, the other one uh, is called Rider 14, and it was uh, a precursor to net metering, actually, I think. Uh, but it, it allows you to sell excess generation to the utility at their uh, highest uh, avoided power plant cost, which is a little above wholesale, but not a whole lot. Um, and uh, it also has some weird rules and restrictions. One of them is you, you don't even know what rate you're getting until after the fact, which I pointed out in testimony violates um, one of our laws uh, on, on the DG program. So um, there really isn't a suitable tariff in existence for customers to use after the cap. When uh, Consumers Energy briefly hit their cap before they voluntarily increased it as part of a settlement, um, they just stopped taking interconnect uh, orders under DG and, and didn't even tell customers there were any other options. And this just created a, a catastrophe in the solar market that we don't want to repeat. The judge agreed that a post cap DG tariff is needed, but again, said there just isn't time to do it in this case. 
So she recommended that the commission require DTE to file one 90 days after this case closes, and then uh, you know interveners can interject on that, which I assume means an entire new docket at the MPSC, which means we're talking you know another year, we'll have already hit the cap. So it's not really a viable solution. Uh, I'm confident that if the commission agreed with this, DT would wait the full 90 days and file something totally unappealing, probably pointing to Rider 14 again. And we'll have to go fight this in a new case. In the meantime, we'll hit the cap, cap and have uh, just, just chaos in the solar industry. So we're definitely going to reply to this. Uh, we have an opportunity to reply to the PFD and say, you know, here's where we think it went wrong and why. Uh, and we'll definitely be doing that. So this is uh, really my biggest concern about uh, what the commission does in their final ruling. The uh, other interesting thing, so DT has been selling green power to both residential and commercial customers at a premium under their Michigan Green Power Program, My Green Power. Um, I entered testimony that argued that DT should be required to buy the renewable energy certificates that represent the greenness of energy, which under law, DG customers own, right? We sell our energy to DT, but we still own the renewable energy certificates and that the commission should set the price of those renewable energy certificates at 80% of the premium DTEs charging other customers, right? Um, staff loved this idea. They jumped right in and rebuttal and said, yep, absolutely. We'll help set that up uh, and organize it. Uh, you know, let's go do that. The judge agreed and recommended a filing 90 days after this case is settled. Um, so if that all happens, right, the important question then is, well, how much is that premium? And when I wrote the testimony, it was quite substantial. Uh, however, <clears throat> Since then, DTE has made an announcement uh, that the green premium is now zero. Um, this was a result of two different things. Uh, one is there was a settlement in another case uh, that forced DTE to restructure their green power program. They had kind of, they were picking and choosing which of their green energy facilities were supplying the residential program and which ones were supplying the big corporations that signed long-term contracts. And they kind of stuck residential customers with their oldest, highest cost facilities. So the settlement said they can't do that. It's one big pool. You got to take the average price. So that brought down the premium. The other thing is the premium is offset by the um, wholesale price of power. Well, natural gas prices have more than doubled uh, in the last year. And so DTE, uh, that, that's reflected then in the price of electricity. Um, so with the green power premium being at zero, 80% of zero, that would be the price of the Rex we would sell them is zero. However, first of all, that's probably a temporary condition. If natural gas prices come down for sure, uh, that the premium will reappear. Um, but the other thing that th this is a great opportunity, right? Customers can now sign up for the My Green Power Program, which forces DT to build more solar and wind systems, and it doesn't cost us anything. Um, that zero premium price condition will last at least until June 1st of 2023. So, uh, what, nine months from now, uh, when the premium gets recalculated. And so I'm urging, uh, everyone to, in DT's territory to sign up for the green power program. Uh, they're going to create a waiting list. So the early birds will get in and the others will get put on a waiting list. Uh, I urge you to sign up soon. You can drop at any time. There's no contract restriction there. Sign up, it's really easy. I did it, it took all of five minutes. I mean, it's really, it's like five clicks. Um, and it's available on their website um, at my www.mygreenpower, that's M-I, greenpower.com. Uh, and it's just that simple. So I am pleased that I've gotten through all that in, oh, and I have, have uh, this is a screen capture of when I signed up, right? You go to their thing, uh, you, they, you put in your info, it shows your account, they see your usage, right? So this is me and my usage is 512 kilowatt hours a month. It says, look, we're already giving you 15% of your power is green. Uh, you can buy up to 85% green power, which I did. So I clicked the plus sign there uh, until it went up to uh, 85% uh, and hit 
continue. And then it gives you an opportunity to um, give them some money to help poor uh, low income people buy green power, but that doesn't make any sense. The premium is zero, so there's no reason to do that. So you click past that and that's it, right? It's, it's two screens. Uh, is green so that, power the same like, as green currents? Ah, so it, it's so yeah. Green currents has been discontinued and it's been it was replaced and and that was my green power and now it's my green power flex. Um, they keep changing the name to confuse the innocent. With that, I will throw it open to uh, questions. Yes, Mr. Cleedy. So if you already have, you're already participating in the My Green Power program, does this kick in automatically or do we have to yes. pop out of the program and re You shouldn't re have to do a thing. Uh, you should just get the new rate, I think, John. Now, the fact that they're calling it a new program, uh, but I think they would automatically do that uh, to the best of my understanding. Good. All right. That's Great. A, Thank you. A good clar clarifying question, though. I can send that to them. I mean, I can easily drop out of the program and then re-enter if, if they right. Exactly. If you have to, you have to, but I, I you shouldn't. Let me document that and then tell the MPC what the DTE may do. <laughs> John, yes. can you take down your presentation? Uh, I can. You want me to stop sharing? Yeah, so we can see everything. And so again, if anybody wants these slides, send me an email, johnrichter1 at comcast.net, and I will uh, send you a, a copy of the slides so that you nobody has to take notes like crazy. Perfect. Okay, John. Uh, let's see, Mr. Uh, Klein. So on the uh, Green Power uh, program, does that require them just to provide your total kilowatt hours that you consume? At some point in time, they say that they've generated that with, with uh, renewable energy. Or does it also require that <clears throat> the energy that I use at night effectively would have to be coming from wind power? Yeah, so all of the energy that you buy from DTE, they have to generate an equivalent amount from green sources, and there's an annual reconciliation of that uh, that they have to prove that they did so. Um, if they generate an excess, they can bank it for the next year. Um, and so there's usually a small amount in the bank so that, uh, you know, to smooth out uh, lumps or whatever. But I mean, in this year, there's going to be a tidal wave of people signing up because it doesn't cost anything now. Yeah. So, I mean, the, it's not a, uh, it's just an average total amount that they would claim is provided by renewable energy. Across their whole uh, generating uh, portfolio and all of their customers that signed up for this. Yes. Yeah. So if I use like whatever, 2000 kilowatt hours in a year or something like that, they'll have, they'll have provided that. But it doesn't ensure necessarily that the two kilowatt hour or the 2000 kilowatt hours that I use usually at nighttime um, are not necessarily coming from wind. It's just that. Right. No, it, 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 there's no time uh, sequence of or no tracing of kilowatt hours, which isn't really feasible. Um, it, yeah. It's just gross over the year. This many kilowatt hours were green. This many kilowatt hours were consumed by people that signed up for green. Yeah. But it does then require that. If, uh, if I use that many kilowatt hours, even though I use it at night, Doesn't at some matter. point, um, that means that they, they, they might, they'll still be burning coal at nighttime, but they Correct. still have to, at some point of the day, provide that power. The vast um, majority of DTE's green power is wind. And if you're consuming power when the wind's not blowing at all, that doesn't matter, right? Yeah, so, okay, all right, great, thanks. I just wanted to clarify that. <clears throat> All right, uh, Joshua, I think you were next. Thanks, and uh, thanks, John, for this presentation. It's great. Uh, I have a, two questions. Uh, specifically, uh, first, is there an opportunity for us to make uh, comments to the MPSC on this rate case? Um, there has been that opportunity. Can you still do that? I don't think so, because the record is closed at this point. But... If you go on the GLREA website and you look at the tab on the top right, you'll see a tab that says take action. And there are two letters that one is, one is to the Public Service Commission 
And there's some language, like a draft letter that's already there, but you can eliminate that and write your own letter and it will send it automatically to the commission. Now, John may be right. It might be too late, but it certainly doesn't hurt to express yourself to the commission because these folks, they are, they, they are sensitive to public opinion. So I would encourage you, Joshua, to, to send the letter anyway. Okay, great. And the other question is, um, were the uh, the issue of virtual power plants brought up in the uh, GLREA's comments or testimony? Uh, a couple things that uh, I just wanted to bring the attention of everybody uh, is that um, uh, these virtual power plants, which is basically individuals connected to solar, who through electronic uh, means, basically this has been this is done by Tesla right now, uh, are basically allowing uh, the elimination or will allow the elimination of these peaker plants. Uh, two examples in California, uh, 2,000 Powerwall owners participated in a virtual power plant event uh, that provided 16 megawatts. And also in Vermont, Green Power has uh, stated that it saved $3 million in 2020 alone by use of these virtual power plants, which are really based on individuals connecting solar to their own homes and then being willing to have that power exported. So this is a uh, is going to be something that's happening in the very, very near future. Uh, it's happening already in many states, including uh, California, Vermont, and probably soon Texas. So is this an issue that the GLRA was able to bring up with the commission since this uh, massive uh, disincentivizing by uh, DTE will actually have costs that are going to increase everyone's rates? In fact, we did. Um, I believe in this case, and certainly in the, the immediately prior case, um, talk about uh, that concept, about the enormous and, and size, the enormous potential of uh, uh, electric vehicles to feed power back into the grid. Uh, DTE, I think it was DTE, it might have been consumers, I think it was DTE, claimed that uh, they couldn't support that because the fault currents wouldn't be high enough to trip their safety equipment, which A, doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and I'm an electrical engineer, and B, um, all these other states are doing it and they use the same equipment. So how is that impossible, right? Uh, but, but, but nobody called them on that. Uh, so th there is a program uh, with uh, DTE where in certain critical peak periods, they will pay you to basically disconnect from the grid and provide all your own power which would be a first step to that, not nearly as, as potent as actually feeding power back into the grid. Um, but that's as close as we've gotten at this point. Joshua, the other point that you made, I think is really relevant, is the fact that we make the argument that the outflow credit should be higher because as a result of all these solar owners putting electricity back to the grid, that DTE doesn't need to bring on their peak or power plants. So we're helping them save money and that should be reflected in the outflow credit. But this is a constant debate we have with DTE, with the Public Service Commission. Thank you. All right, Dave, I think you're next. Uh, yeah, so that this, uh, you got me interested in this, my green power, because I was in green currents, but I was like, it's stupid for me to give them an extra 10 bucks. Right. <laughs> you know, so the question is, is can we somehow force them to have this instead of an opt-in program, an opt-out program. So by default, everybody's in and they would have to opt out. I would say the statute that enabled that does not support that option. Um, it, that, that the statute, statute says that, that customers must be given the option to do so. Um, but like, I, what about I, new customers? Maybe, all, maybe new customers, the default is to opt in. <laughs> It's an interesting idea. I, I don't think the commission would, would go for that. Um, there is it's the same thing. So every rate class <laughs> has a default tariff, right? That unless you ask for something else, you get. Right now for residential customers, that's the, uh, the D1 tariff. Uh, that is probably going to change in the near future to be a time of use tariff. Uh, that's an issue in this case, by the way. Um, but uh, I, I can't see the commission agreeing to make a, a green tariff the, the default, particularly if there was any premium involved, which- Well, you know, exactly, but the fact that there's no premium says, why, why wouldn't it be a default in, you have to opt out if you don't want it. Anyway, so- 
John, would it hurt us if we put that in your reply to the PFD? Just to plant that idea with the commission? Um, no, it's too late in this case, John. We could certainly do it in the next uh, case or in the consumer's rate case. Uh, but replies to the PFD can only address issues that are already open in the case and, and testimony that's in the record. And that's a whole new idea. So it's too late for that one. And the other thought I've always had is, uh, particularly with DT, they're, they're, they're doing time of day rates, you know, where they're going to charge us more in the afternoon. I wonder if there's some way we can put a program together where they would incentivize people to put solar on west facing roofs. And then that I have written testimony exactly on that point uh, that that time of day uh, rates should have very high price differentials. And that will create an incentive for exactly that. I said, you know, facing their, their solar west. Um, nobody seemed to pick up on that idea. But um, yeah, and and so one of the, the benefits of the current way that the outflow is computed, right, being that it's based on uh, an existing inflow tariff, is that every time they ask for an increase in rates, we get an increase in the outflow too, right? Uh, that would continue in a time of use uh, environment and uh, to, to your point, the bigger the differential, as long as the high priced energy is during the day, that's beneficial to solar. Now, right. I will point out in California, their solar penetration has gotten so large that their time of use rates are now inverted. And the lowest cost of electricity is from like 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. or something like that when <laughs> solar is cranking out. And the high rate is in the evening. That, that's the peak rate. And, and even the 3 a.m. rate is higher than the, uh, the rate in at noon. So um, and, and given their generation portfolio, that's actually reasonable, right? Uh, Michigan's a very long way from that. Thank you. All right, Dale, did you have another question or uh, did you just not put your hand out? Okay, and Mark, did you have another question? Yeah, it has to do with um, the new zero migraine power program. So, so I have solar on my house, but I, I make up the, it's not 100%. And so I make up the difference by doing 100% of the power that I buy from DTA, DTE from their green power program to achieve 100% green power. So my question is this under the new green power program, because you know, I've been emotionally distraught because DTE has stigmatized me as a free rider. So my question is, if I buy that migraine program, does it remove the stain of being called a free rider by DTE for my buying a solar system and helping to save the environment, stimulate small business in Michigan and, and do all those other things? Um, does this new thing remove that stain or does DTE still get to call me a free rider in their rate cases? Uh, I, I think they'll continue doing that if I was going to uh, bet money, Mark. But um, th they've been saying for a very long time that, uh, you know, green power is great, but it's just too expensive uh, and people don't want to pay the price. That has blown up that argument, right? That they have now publicly said, no, actually, green isn't any more expensive at all uh, than, than our existing generation portfolio. Um, I just think we, we need to, to make uh, propaganda hay out of that. Dave. There we go. Uh, I just wondered, uh, and thank you very much for letting us in on all of this stuff that's going on behind the scenes. Will uh, you be able to do the same thing when consumers goes through this? Yes, and I'm glad you asked. Um, so consumers has a uh, concurrent rate case going on. It's, it's uh, in the earlier stages than this one. Uh, they've taken testimony, and I believe briefs are due in a week or two. Um, and consumers in that case has also proposed reducing the outflow rate to being uh, wholesale for energy. And then they've got a complicated formula about how they'd compensate you for capacity. Um, but the point is, it would be a substantial cut in the outflow rate. And we're also an intervener in that case and testifying against that. Um, and I think one of the reasons this case is really important is it's going to sort of set the standard for that case as well. The commission in general likes to keep consistency, not in exactly what the rates are, but in the way they're computed. 
right? And so I would be very surprised if they would say, well, we're going to do full power supply for outflow in this case, and then turn around and say, oh, but consumers is going to do it a whole different way, right? Um, it's not impossible, but that'd be very surprising. And yes, we will certainly um, uh, keep people up to date. We are aware that more of our members are in consumers territory than DTE's territory. And so uh, arguably that case is, is more important uh, in terms of impact uh, from that perspective. We will keep you up to date. That's what we're here for. And Dale, you're back for seconds. Yeah, so I did have another, another question I thought of. So is there anything that we can look and see um, you know, we say that on a sunny day, electricity gets cheaper and on a windy night, it should be cheaper too. Is there anything that shows what DTE chooses to curtail at certain points or do they just go on burning natural gas and coal, even though there's wind power, you know, in the area or there's solar power? Um, I, uh, is there anything down at that level of detail just to that's a, that's a great question, Dale. Um, so first of all, I'll, I'll, let me talk about how that works. So um, there's this concept called dispatch order, right? And it's not up to each individual utility. It's actually MISO. It's the, the Midwest uh, Independent System Operator that uh, kind of measures load and says, we need more uh, power. Scotty, I need more power um, in this region or that and directs the utility to, to fire up uh, their next lowest cost power plant to do that, right? Uh, however, there's exceptions to that. And coal plants and, uh, are, are a great exception. You can't turn a coal plant on an hour and then turn it off for the next hour. Uh, they don't operate that way. You're, you're gonna do damage to the, uh, the system. And uh, so they run those coal plants even through the winter when they don't need the power. And I, and I and several other interviewers have done testimony saying, look, other states have actually gone to seasonal operation of coal plants where they run them in the summer and they turn them off for the winter. And uh, yeah, the, the utilities here have resisted that. They love running those plants. I can see it would create a staffing problem for them, right? What do you, what do, you do with the coal plant staff during the winter? Um, but that's about the only reasonable excuse I can think of and not the one they gave. Um, but uh, in terms of, is there available data somewhere where you can see that? Maybe at MISO. Yeah. Boy, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, my, MISO will, will tell you how much power was done on their whole system on a per hour basis, right? You can download a, the last uh, 12 months of data and I've done that as well as the, the pricing at which it traded. But can you look at individual plants and see, not that I'm aware of, um, obviously, the utilities have that data. Does the commission have that data? The commission gets reports that says how many kilowatt hours each plant produced during the course of the year, but I don't think they get like hourly detail on that. So how much can coal plants um, maybe not turn off all the way, but throttle down or... Yeah, um, so part of that is they're in units. Like Monroe has four separate units that operate independently. And so they can turn one off and leave the other three running or whatever. Uh, they can also throttle them back quite a bit. And there's a figure for that. There's even a term for it, like a minimum operating uh, power, which I think is down at you know 20 or 30% of capacity or something, right? But they don't turn them all the way off. John, why don't you mention the integrated resource plan that DTE is going to have to file that mm. this stuff may have a bearing on it? It does. It's related to what Dale's asking. Um, so... Every five years or sometimes more frequently, Michigan utilities have to file an integrated resource plan. It's a whole nother case at the MPSC. DTE is gonna be filing their next one uh, next month. Um, and they have to lay out for the next 20 years, how are they gonna meet demand? So first they make projections about what demand is gonna be. And then they study different ways of meeting that demand and what's the lowest cost way of doing it. Historically, that's been what new plants do they build to meet the new higher demand? But for the last 20 years, power demand has been flat and in Michigan, it's actually been declining. So it's more a question of, well, which plants should you be retiring? And meanwhile, you are building green stuff. So that's more retiring you need to do. And they kind of argue that, that, well, that's their prerogative and they don't have to. So anyway, uh, we will be intervening in that case as well. And um, it gives us really an eyeball into what the, the costs of these plants are. And in those cases, we see 
actual uh, operating costs, fuel costs, capital costs, right? All that stuff is in there as exhibits. It's hundreds of spreadsheets of hundreds of pages each, uh, but the data is there. Uh, and it's uh, really interesting if you, you have that kind of mindset. All right, that's probably more answered than uh, Dale really uh, wanted, but uh, Kate, let's hear your question. Thank you. Uh, thanks for doing the intervening and thank you for your upcoming intervening with Consumers Energy. And I'm wondering with, there were two things that you mentioned, one where DTE has to wait 90 days before some, I've got it all mixed up, I think, but um, so after the 90 days, you have a chance to rewrite something, two things that you were contesting, but it, it'll have to wait to the next case. So my question is, can we jump ahead and have those questions for consumers energy ahead of time? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so we try mm -hmm. and kind of do carryovers from one utility yeah. to the other, right? Because the issues are 90% the same. Uh, sometimes there's differences, but but an awful lot of it is, is the same stuff. Um, like DT is a special issue with their grid in the city of Detroit that's older than all the rest of it. That's on a lower voltage and they have all kinds of problems with that, and, right? So that's a unique thing to them that's that's distinct from uh, consumers, for example. But certainly, um, yeah, the, uh, the need, well, so in the case of consumers, the need for a post DG cap tariff has been delayed because consumers as part of a settlement agreement increased their cap. So we've got a couple more years to work that out. Whereas for DTs refusing to lift their cap, it became urgent. Uh, and that's why we have to address that in, in their case. Uh, the other one that talked about 90 days after was the idea of a, uh, I think the, the, um, uh, the, the community solar uh, option. That was right? it. And uh, that's certainly been an issue in consumer cases. So I think that same idea might carry over there. Certainly, uh, Julie Baldwin is on that case. She has proposed a similar thing in that case, I believe. Uh, so yeah, that that's kind of going to be a replay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to. Very welcome. I try and think ahead too. Uh, I've already got started a list of issues I want to bring up in the next DTE rate case right uh that either uh didn't get resolved in this or or you know didn't get addressed uh kind of you know whole new things we we want to dig at i'm still trying to get the outflow rate increased to reflect um savings in distribution system costs i filed a lot of testimony in that in this case they rebuffed it uh but uh, i'm going to come back at that um the utility keeps trying to cut the rate every case so i'm going to try and increase it every case i can be just as repetitious as they can <laughs> yeah, and I just want to mention to everybody that we have a special membership option to support our our uh, public service commission regulatory work. It's like forty dollars per year, something like that, for an individual. So if anybody wants to specifically support this work that GLREA is doing, um, you can, in addition to your normal membership, you can also be a you can also add on a second membership for supporting the. The utility work, um, or for new members, you can just select that option alone too. So just go on, uh, just go on the uh, the join it website, and you can see it. So, other questions, Mark, Mark coming up again. Yeah, John. In terms of the integrated resource plan for consumers, um, you know that you were. Well, DT is next, these, right? DT is filing next month, right. but consumers are coming up. Right. So, you know, they, um, you know, you've said before that, you know, that these cases, you know, if they lose something one time, it'll show up in another case. So it keeps rolling. So when we, the, um, these guys were doing the original uh, integrated research planning, this is four or five years ago in the work group that was associated with beforehand, they, the utilities were testing out ideas, I think. And one of them uh, ideas that they tested out was that people who do energy efficiency are free riders and should pay a special fee on top of it because they don't use enough electricity and they're therefore free riders. You can imagine how that went over in the work group, but my sense is as they, you know, distributed generation uh, continues to happen and they keep losing ways to, you know, trying to, uh, 
make money here is this issue of energy efficiency is going to come come back up. And I'm just wondering if that's one area that we might want to leap ahead on and say, you know, that energy efficiency should be sacrosanct and, and uh, you know, somehow um, people I, who I would that say should, to some benefit. degree we already did um, yeah. in that uh, in this case, one of the arguments we made against the demand charge was that from, and I said these words, right, from the utility side of the meter, self-consumption is indistinguishable from energy efficiency. And uh, the, um, the, the commission staff said similar things, right? So we sort of took it as an assumption that energy efficiency, you get to save the money, right? Uh, and, and that therefore uh, self-consumption of a DG customer would be treated the same. And so I, I think that's a, a good basis, you know, for, for what you're saying. But yeah, um, years back, there was an issue in utility regulation and, and it was somewhat successful that the utility said a big industrial customer that then puts in a big generator and some of them did that, right? Because they needed to waste heat anyway. Uh, they said, well, the, we, we're going to charge them standby charges because they're buying less electricity from us except they might, when that generator breaks, suddenly need a lot. So we have to be ready for that. And that imposes costs on us. And, and they impose standby charges. I, I can see them going at DG uh, with that same idea, right? That, uh, um, you know, at any given point, the sun's not shining. We have to be ready for that. So we're going to charge you a, a bonus fee. And they did uh, propose that, right? In the first DG case, they wanted to charge, they call it a system access charge. And it was that that same kind of idea. So yeah, that ground's been been certainly touched on. All right, Dave. Yeah, two more quick ones. Uh, do you think the meeting in Detroit had any effect on the MPSEs like decisions? And how does Michigan's uh, electrical uh, cost uh, compare to other states? So um, Michigan's electric rates, residential electric rates are significantly higher uh, than the other uh, Midwest states and DTEs is higher than, than consumers. Uh, and we also have some of the lowest reliability. So there was a lot of testimony in this case and you certainly heard it at that hearing that, uh, hey, their prices are too high and their reliability sucks. Uh, and the commission shortly after that uh, did a press release or a, a sort of order saying, yeah, it was an order saying, uh, Util Michigan Utilities reliability is not good enough, and you guys are going to have to submit plans to us about how you're going to fix that. Uh, I don't think that timing was coincidental. So I think uh, that case certainly had an effect. I think it also gives the commission um, a sense of the people and a certain amount of political cover uh, to, to slam the utilities when they see just how angry people really are. There was a lot of, I was in that room. I testified at that. There, there was a lot of rage in that room. And uh, I, I don't think uh, the commissioners being human beings could ignore that, uh, even if perhaps legally it had, you know, the arguments made didn't have real legal merit. Yeah, so, I was there. It was pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that was was worthwhile. Janice. And I was there too, and I certainly agree with you, John. Uh, it, regarding community solar, one of the arguments that I think that we should be very strongly make is that the grid as it exists right now will not remain as reliable as it has been. If uh, anybody watched the 60 Minutes program, I believe it was Sunday before last, when they talked about how easy it would be to to cripple really our grid system. And certainly with all uh, the climate change uh, effects that we're having on increased uh, severity of hurricanes, for example, where we're losing the grid. If we promote uh, community solar as a solution to this, I think it's a very strong argument and I would really like to see us move on that. Yeah, and I think more precisely, Janice, that the solution is microgrids, right, which community solar is, is, is one form of. Right. Um, so I go back to the 2003 power outage. I was thinking about this at breakfast. It's funny you bring this up. Um, that, that, that one tree touching one line wiped out power from Maine to Michigan right. is insane, right? And, and given electrical engineering, there really, we couldn't avoid that. Um, uh, half a century ago, uh, but now with with electronic controls, there's no excuse for it. 
right? We should be able to isolate sections of the grid uh, and not let an outage in one area just cascade like that and wipe things out. And, and the term for that, we need microgrids, right? And we need that to be a part of the, um, the integrated resource planning. And there has been testimony to that effect, but we need to keep coming at that uh, so that uh, we are not all at the uh, uh, whims of, of the, the overall grid, right? It's a, a great point, Janice, thank you. Um, yes, Ken. Uh, I don't know if this question is out of scope here tonight or not, but let me throw it in and see what happens. What effect do you see the newly passed IRA having on sort of utility politics of the sort we're talking about tonight? Yeah, I don't think that's out of scope at all. We were talking about the IRP, and one of the criticisms of DTE's IRP that they haven't even filed yet um, is that they did all the analysis before the IRA passed, so it doesn't reflect it. Uh, that's a pretty critical failing because the IRA is definitely going to make um, wind and, and, and solar more economical, uh, both utility, wind and solar, and of course, residential as well. But particularly for the IRP, it, you know, it, they're going to get a larger tax credit. It's going to make it cheaper, period, right? Um, that's kind of the effect that within the green community has all been written and talked about is, is you know, the tax credits got reset at 30% and extended, and now you have a choice between a, a tax credit or a, um, uh, a PTC, a uh, power uh, produced kind of credit. Um, but there's also uh, substantial credits in there for carbon sequestration. And DTE and their IRP is going to talk about that and suggest that they they do a pilot program to try sequestering carbon out of one of their power plants uh, because there's now substantial tax credits for doing that as well. Uh, so I think the IRA is going to have some pretty substantial impacts on uh, what kind of power utilities uh, build in the future. And the other thing is that with the investment tax credit at 30% for 10 years, this is going to put a lot of private sector market pressure on the utilities to allow homeowners, individuals to install their own solar systems. So we have seven minutes left and we've got a bunch of people. We have Ken, David and Jens. And then if we get through those three, then we'll go back to Mark. So let's try and go through these uh, questions by um, by David and Jens. So, David, go ahead. Uh, yes, we have a movement in town uh, which is pushing for the municipalization of uh, power. Uh, they call themselves Ann Arbor for Public Power. Could you comment on the feasibility of that kind of um, that that kind of pro program and the desirability of it? Yeah. So uh, Michigan law allows any municipality to provide their own power, right? So we have lots of cities that do that, right? Uh, Lansing Power and Light, right? A municipal utility provides power to Lansing. Uh, and they have the authority to uh, buy out uh, the utility in their region, right? Buy their distribution lines uh, and any other um, equipment that they may have there and set up their own uh, plant. No Michigan municipality has done it in 100 years. Uh, and there's a very sticky legal question of how do we negotiate what the fair price of that is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, my accounting inclination is on the public record is the book value of that equipment that is used in the utility rate setting every year. Uh, why wouldn't that be the established value, right? But it's it's a big upfront capital cost, right? So it, right. it would be uh, certainly expensive to do. I would love to see Ann Arbor and or other municipalities do that uh, in part because I think our utilities need some competition. Mm -hmm. And right now the only competition they really have, well, they have some competition in generation through the dispatch order of MISO that I talked about, but not very much because the power has to be locally generated. Um, and the only other competition really are PURPA facilities and, and homes and businesses that put on their own solar systems. And I would love to see another avenue of uh, competition of municipalities saying, you're so bad, we're gonna do it better ourselves. Uh, and and just force them to shape up because frankly, they don't have the, uh, the market forces that make them care about things that any for-profit corporation care deeply about. Mm -hmm. um, in the for-profit business, it's every year, it's we must do more with less, 
do more with less, right? Was our, our chant in the companies I worked in. Regulated utilities have no such incentive. And, John, and it, what does PERPA mean? I'm sorry. That's the um, Public Regulatory Utilities uh, Policy, Policy Act. Act. Thank you. 1978. Uh, a law requiring utilities to buy green power from uh, third parties uh, at their avoided cost, which unfortunately is a rather vague term. But um, yes. Uh, okay. Did that cover your question, David? Yeah, pretty well. Uh, but let's say at the end of the day, if, if they were able to implement such a program, uh, would we be better off or not? I don't know. Okay. My inclination is you're probably better off unless you're incompetent. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. And look at the chat. Julie Roth tells you what the Ann Arbor SEU -SE is proposing. Excellent. Thanks, Sandra. Yeah. I've got a website. Yeah. Infrastructure. Right. All right, Jens, you're up. Uh, yeah, I think maybe before the kind of buying DT out in, in Ann Arbor, for example, this community solar is probably a, a real great kind of interim step uh, where we, you know, uh, some limited, lesser scope, but uh, faster to, to get to. Uh, one question was this 2% this cap, but do they have any like technical reason? I mean, that must fall apart like on the, the first glance of an engineer, no? Yeah, uh, so the Public Service Commission has publicly stated in testimony before the uh, House Energy Committee that there is no engineering reason why that cap should exist. Um, and no economic reason. And no economic that. reason why that cap should exist. The cap was created back in 2008 as part of the net metering program when, frankly, we didn't know all that much, right? This, this was all kind of a new turf, particularly in Michigan. And uh, net metering seemed kind of generous to some members of Congress at the time. And they said, well, we'll put a cap at 1% of peak demand. And that seemed like that would be decades away, right? It really wasn't a big concern. It was just sort of a, a guardrail in case things went crazy somehow, right? Uh, by all rights, it should have been repealed when they repealed net metering and replaced it with a DG program. Uh, but given that most of that law was written by the utility companies, uh, I'm not surprised that that didn't happen. Um, yeah, I think that covers that. Uh, yep, Mark, thank you. Back to you. <laughs> so I just want to comment on the Ann Arbor case again. Um, the, the city of Ann Arbor has authorized a feasibility study to be done on the sustainable energy utility. Um, essentially, that would be a new utility, a, a type of, of utility that would operate in parallel with DTE. So customers and our citizens could choose to stay with DTE or be part of a the Ann Arbor Sustainable Energy Utility. Um, and uh, they, uh, one of the benefits would be the solar users could put more solar on their house than they use and sell that power to the sustainable energy utility who would pay uh, pay back to this, this cities at a much higher rate than DTE does. So that has now been authorized by the city. They're expending uh, resources. They're gonna look at the sustainable utility. They're also gonna look at the municipalization option and uh, come out with a recommendation next summer um, about which way to go. In the meantime, Julie Roth, who's here tonight, um, she's put up through, uh, through their Solarize Ann Arbor program, 3.4 megawatts of solar distributed solar on people's houses in the last two, two some odd years. So um, I think the trick here is no matter what we do, install solar, install it now, install as much as you can. Um, and, you know, the more solar that we bring on, the better the argument is to the Public Service Commission. Do they really want to pass laws that cause people from one end of the state to the other to shut off their solar systems, take them off their roof and sign up with uh, DTE who's going to sell us clean power manufactured with methane spewing fracked gas. They're not doing renewable energy and, and we are. So, you know, the bottom line is um, more solar is the better. Tomorrow, call up a solar installer, expand your array or put up new stuff. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. Ken, you get the final question. I'm honored. Uh, thank you, GRE, for doing all this. And, and John, this has been a really good thing. And Mark, I got to have a beer with you someday. Um, <laughs> my real question is, 
DTE and consumer, I just read an article today, which I still haven't vetted, are putting tremendous amount of dollars into legislators' pocketbooks so they can get reelected. Do you have any comments on that, you or, or John Freeman? And, and is, there a, is there part of GLRE that is looking at that? Yeah, so we're well aware of it. Uh, it's, it's, you know, publicly posted and they use a lot of dark money that's harder to track. And, and it's, it's corrosive to democracy. And if I was king, the first rule of a regulated monopoly is you can't make political donations. End of story, right? Uh, you, you don't get to use the profits you extracted from unwilling customers to uh, control the, the legislature that determines what your profits are. It, it, it's, it's insane. Um, but uh, yes, we also have a, uh, uh, we're doing some things in that area, I, I guess. I don't know, John, if you want to go. It may be on the scope, but what can we as members do to help you guys? Well, the key thing we're trying to do with GLREA is just to educate people about the practices that the DTE and consumers engage in, in terms of how they operate within the legislature. The other thing that I find fascinating, Ken, is I don't know how many of you all listened to the Tiger ball games over the summer, but DTE advertises all the time, even though they have no competition. So the reason why they advertise is because they know that most people don't like them. And so they are, they're trying to promote a, a positive image, even when, you know, like utilities are, are very viewed very unpopularly. So we just need to educate people about what DTE does. And at that public hearing in Detroit, there was a lot of people that commented on how much money the DTE does give legislators. So we just have to keep spreading the word about why we need to have you know reform and why we need to try and enact new policies that will support the expansion of solar. I so, thought I I thought I heard John that and maybe I read this wrong that there was some part of a lobbyist organization you guys were building that was separate from GLREA. It is, but we can't talk about it because this is a C3 educational opportunity. All right, All right. fair enough. I'll, I'll send you an email. That sounds fine. Thank you. So, so I'm going to give John Richter the final, final kind of wrap up comment before we sign off tonight. So John, any final thoughts you want to share? Sure. So uh, we are going to continue to intervene in utility cases, rate cases, um, integrated resource plans and, and others and fight for uh, solar in Michigan uh, and wind, but uh, especially solar that's owned by the customer behind the meter. Uh, we're the premium group that represents that. And uh, we're gonna keep doing that. And uh, we, we can always use more members uh, and Hopefully with the change in, in the legislature, uh, we'll be able to do some more things there. We, we've really had a blockage there uh, so far, but um, we're, we're gonna keep fighting this fight and it goes on forever. Uh, unfortunately, that's, that's how that is. It's the nature of the beast. And yeah, we we'll have be to there. be as persistent and as resilient as the utilities are. But what's, what the good thing is, is that we know we have the people behind us because this country is embracing renewable energy. People in this country want to be able to take control of their whole energy. And, they, and now there's technology for people and business to do that. And so we just need to rally and organize and build up this organization and bring more people into the fold so then we can then apply pressure on the Public Service Commission to adopt policies that will support this vision. And for anybody that's not a member of GLREA that's on this presentation, I certainly would encourage you to go to our website and click under the membership tab and become a member. So with that, I wanna thank everybody for joining us this evening. I wanna particularly thank John Richter. He did an amazing job. So let's give him a thumbs up or a silent clap or whatever, and just express our appreciation for the incredible work that he has done. And so with that, we hope all of you have a wonderful evening and join us for next week's, um, next week's solar story will actually be the solar home tour um, on October 6th. 
And then the following week, we will have a presentation by Will Kenworthy to talk about the new federal legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is also an amazing new law that's going to help us in our mission to expand renewable energy across Michigan and across the country. So with that, I want to thank all of you and have a wonderful evening.